Hey, Scott, how you doing? Uh, I'm good, thanks, Saka. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I was, uh, you know, while everyone's logging in, I was just going to do a brief introduction, if that's okay. Perfect. All right. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Professor Scott Galloway, uh, he's an NYU professor of marketing. Uh, he's a New York Times bestselling author, public speaker, podcast host, and entrepreneur, really does it all. Uh, he's the author of Digital IQ Index, uh, which is a global ranking of prestige brands' digital competence. Uh, in 2012, he was named one of the world's 50 best business school professors, quite an honor. Uh, he founded several firms, including L2, Red Envelope, and Profit. Uh, he was elected to the World Economic Forum's Global Leaders of Tomorrow, which recognizes 100 individuals under the age of 40 whose accomplishments have impacted on a global level. He served on the board of directors for Eddie Bauer, New York Times, Gateway Computer, and Berkeley's School of Business. Uh, by way of background, his education is uh, UCLA for undergraduate and then an MBA from Berkeley. Uh, most importantly, his latest book, which is a New York Times bestseller, is Post-Corona from Crisis to Opportunity. Uh, it's an amazing book, really summarizes all of the opportunities that can come out of this difficult situation. Uh, and so we're going to be discussing that today. As, as you can see, Scott is a South Florida resident. Looks like he's got a beautiful home. Wow, that's quite a home. <laughs> Absolutely stunning. So anyway, welcome from welcome from South Florida. And we look forward to, to talking about your new book, which has gotten rave reviews. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, it's great to be. Uh, you, know, you had me at the University of Miami. I'm about 50 miles north of you and just respect for Florida. Oh, well, fantastic. And, and again, thanks for all you've done. Um, you know, I am actually um, uh, from New York. And so having someone who teaches up at NYU is a great honor. So um, anyway, uh, COVID is obviously one of the biggest crises in the last century, and your book kind of talks about how there could be some silver linings to this pandemic, and it talks about how both it exposes our weaknesses and it also accelerates progress. Maybe talk a little bit about how this crisis can actually become an opportunity for us as a country. Uh, uh, sure. So uh, thanks for setting this up and thanks for having me. So there are enormous... Uh, silver linings here. I would say probably the biggest opportunity is in your field, doctor. I think that if you think about uh, the biggest increases in stakeholder value uh, the last 50 years in our economy, first was globalization, leveraging the comparative advantage of different nations. Uh, the second was digitization, the process. Can't hear you. Is, is your volume back on? Some, there you go. It's back on. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Now? Yep. Uh, yeah. Someone just called me. Uh, the the new one or the next one is what I would call the great dispersion, and that is simply taking uh, value that's delivered to the end consumer or the end customer, and bypassing or skipping moments of friction or distribution, and making the process more streamlined, more effective, reaching more people. So a basic example. Wonder Woman 1984 skips the movie theater, skips the window, and goes straight into your living room. We've dispersed retail from stores and shelves to warehouses and phones. Uh, we're starting to disperse education from campuses to, to our handhelds. The dispersion of healthcare, I mean, I would, I would estimate 99% plus percent of the people who have contracted, endured, and developed antibodies for the novel coronavirus will have never stepped foot in a doctor's office, much less a hospital. So the opportunity to disperse healthcare to people's smart speakers and smartphones offers a couple enormous opportunities. One, healthcare could go from being reactive and disease-driven to proactive. We could dramatically lower the cost. We could, dramatic, we could increase access to healthcare to an entire population of people who are intimidated, don't have the resources, don't have the money, don't have the confidence. It takes confidence to proactively manage your health care. Uh, I'm an investor in a company called 98.6, which is effectively a primary care uh, health care company that sells into the enterprise. And it's an app on your phone. You click on the app. It asks you a series of AI-driven questions about what's bothering you, and then it pairs you with the right medical profession, and that person pops up in a format similar to this. 
And we found that 30% of the people making health inquiries are doing, doing so while they're in a meeting. So the idea of, of playing offense on your health care, dispersing health care to people's uh, devices, I mean, a lot of people don't have health insurance. A lot of people don't have the money. A lot of people don't have the confidence, the knowledge to access health care. But everybody in America has a smartphone. So I think the dispersion of health care in what is the most disruptable industry in history, 17% of U.S. GDP, uh, every year it's increased prices faster than inflation, but every year the outcomes are either flat or down. People are very dissatisfied with health care in this country. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's dramatic opportunities in health care. There's huge opportunities in my industry where uh, we have become drunk on exclusivity and brag about rejecting 90% of our applications, uh, which is tantamount, in my view, to bragging a head of a housing shelter homeless shelter bragging that they turned away 90% of the people who showed up last night. My colleagues and I have become drunk on exclusivity. We've lost the script. We, we're public servants, not luxury brands. Small and big technology gives us the opportunity to dramatically increase the sizes of our courses. My course used to be 180 kids because the largest room at Stern at the business school held 180 people. I took my course online. It's now 280 kids with almost no incremental expense. I'd like to think at some point we'll be forced to pass those savings on to end consumers. And we need to take education back to where it was when I applied to UCLA. When I applied to UCLA, it was a 60% admittance rate. And I didn't get in the first time I applied. I was an unremarkable kid living in a household with $40,000 in income raised by a single immigrant mother. And I was unremarkable. And I don't say that as some humble brag. I was genuinely unremarkable. And and slowly but surely, UCLA has decreased its admittance rates to 12%. And now we let in two cohorts, the children of rich people and freakishly remarkable kids from middle and lower income holds, uh, households. I think education's mission is not to take the 1% uh, to billionaire status. It's to help the unremarkables get into the top 1%. So I think the, the dispersion of value in healthcare, I think the embrace of technology to dramatically expand enrollments and decrease costs across our best universities offer enormous opportunities. And then it goes on from there. Might we decide in Florida, I mean, look how goddamn beautiful it is here today. <laughs> and you know what? It's because we're not spewing as much shit into the air, uh, because we're not commuting, because we don't have as many planes in the air. It, is this an opportunity to leave behind some of the emissions we've been spewing into the air? Maybe we decide, okay, we don't need to commute to work five times a week. Maybe it's three times a week. And maybe we take that four hours and we spend more time with our kids or making money. Uh, there's enormous opportunity here. And I'd also like to think, and then I'll, I'll be quiet, that we're, that hopefully we're maturing a generation of young people that look at us and say, global cooperation is important. Empathy for for young people it's important that the wealthiest country in the world shouldn't have one in five households with children be food insecure that this is an opportunity to rethink cooperation maybe the cdc that has a seven billion dollar budget and the military that has a 700 billion dollar budget as far as i can tell there are no tanks lining up at the canadian or the mexican american border but we've had a virus penetrate our borders easily and kill more people than world war ii and world war one combined maybe our priorities are a little out of whack so i, I think there's Enormous opportunity, but they're not going to happen organically. At the end of World War II, we had a huge opportunity, and we made a conscious decision to make a massive investment in rebuilding what was once our enemies and turning them into our allies. We, they're enormous opportunities, but they won't happen organically. We have to be thoughtful about them. We have to embrace them and shift our mindset. And uh, crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So I think we're at a crossroads. This is either the beginning of the end of American c civilization or a huge opportunity for renewal. And I, I love Anna, Amanda Gorman's line that, you know, that hopefully this is a nation not broken, but just unfinished. That was a speech. Oh my <laughs> God, that was a speech. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, now you mentioned e-commerce. I just want to get your opinion on that because, you know, there's been more change in e-commerce in the last 10 months than in the last several decades. Explain that boom and what that means for, for e-commerce moving forward. So the, the enduring impact of the novel coronavirus will be uh, its role as an accelerant more than a change in it. And that is not much has changed, it's just accelerated dramatically. So 
if you look at e-commerce, loosely speaking, e-commerce started getting traction at the turn of the millennium in 2000. And roughly every year, it's garnered an additional one percentage of total retail, meaning that by 2020, we were sitting at approximately 18% of all retail was transacted through digital channels. And it was growing about 1% a year. And then in eight weeks, it jumped to 28%. So we had a decade of e-commerce acceleration in eight weeks. We had uh, six years of acceleration in online grocery delivery. We had 20 years acceleration of work from home. We also had some dramatic acceleration in dysfunctional things. We've gone from a dysfunctional economy to a dystopian one where our most vulnerable, all of a sudden overnight in New York, you are more likely to run into somebody who's been to a food bank in the last 30 days in New York State than run into someone who has a college degree. 34% of people in New York have been to a food bank in the last 30 days, 32% of a college degree. So a lot of the very disturbing attributes in our economy have gone parabolic. And a lot, you know, you take any trend, take any trend in your life personally and professionally and say, what are the two or three most dominant trends? Take that line for the last 10 years and then take it out 10 years from here and ask yourself, are we here right now? Uh, because everything has massively accelerated, both positive and negative. Wow. And, you know, uh, I mean, obviously, Amazon is the big winner when you're talking about e-commerce. Amazon has just blown up in the last year or so. You've been quoted as saying that Amazon was essentially built for a pandemic. Do you, do you still believe that? I mean, if anyone has a crystal ball and knew this was going to happen, it was Jeff Bezos. Look at the business he's in. E-commerce, massive acceleration. Oh, what, we, what else are we doing? We are, we are sitting at home watching uh, Amazon Prime Video. Okay, he's got an online video service. What are we also doing? We're at home using all of our devices downloading a massive amount of data every day. Remote work is, is means everything's digitized and there's just more data flow. Who owns the largest cloud services company in the world? Well, Amazon does. Uh, all of a sudden, healthcare is being dispersed to the home. Who's in our homes three times a week and who has smart speakers that could potentially begin to deliver healthcare in the home? I mean, it's it's literally as if this company was designed for a pandemic and they don't have to close their stores down. They don't have stores. They don't have to distance because everything's remote. It just feels as if Amazon, I mean, Google and Facebook got hit, but they're coming back. Apple slowed down a little bit because people started rethinking, do I want to spend $1,100 on a phone? Because they got a little economically secure for a hot minute. But Amazon accelerated through this pandemic. I, I've never seen a company firing on all 12,000 cylinders the way Amazon is. They're just in every business that is, you know, the, the pandemic has been, the wind at their back. And here's, here's the dangerous thing about that doctor is that Amazon stock is up 68% since it's March lows. And unfortunately, I think that's been bad for our society because if the NASDAQ had been cut in half, if Apple, Amazon, and Facebook stock were down 70%, I wonder if those Amazon vans would be showing up, delivering our Nespresso pods, and then sticking a needle in our arm. I don't think we've had a full-throated capital response to this pandemic because the dirty, ugly secret of this pandemic is that the shareholder class that controls government or has outsized influence on government, who have outsized influence on our economy, our decisions, our media, you know, we don't like to say this, we're living our best lives. If you're blessed with good health, if you're in the top 10%, you're spending the pandemic has meant you're spending more time with Netflix, you're spending more time with your kids, and your wealth has exploded. And I'm not saying that rich people want a pandemic. I'm not saying that they're not empathetic to the death, disease, and disability it's causing. But are you as motivated to really sacrifice? Are you as motivated to figure out how your firm, at the, uh, seven days after Pearl Harbor, Chrysler converted their largest factory in Michigan to a factory punching out M1 Bradley tanks in that one factory? produce more tanks than the entire Third Reich. Has any company other than a company that's profit motivated like a pharma firm and a hospital that is filled with empathetic people, has any one firm in the United States really pivoted their entire firm and said, we're at war, let's go on a war footing, let's start producing tanks. So I feel like we haven't had the full-throated capitalist response to this because, you know, it's kind of stop, stop, it hurts so good. 
the wealthy are living their best lives. So I wonder if the market's acceleration has created moral hazard and a general feeling or a gestalt in our society where we've outsourced the majority of the misery to people who just don't have any influence. What if this was killing thin white people? Would we have had a different response? So I, I think we're going to do a lot of navel gazing and soul searching here and decide that maybe the stimulus that pumped up artificially the NASDAQ was probably a bad thing and resulted in more death. So I was going to say, you know, that, that kind of plays to your point that you discussed, that there's really two pandemics. It's the blue collar pandemic and the white collar pandemic. And I, I think you, you kind of speak to that where if you have the resources, you're a lot less hurt by the pandemic than if you don't have the resources, which also leads to the discussion, like, why do you think that the stock market is doing well despite the economic problems that we're having in this country? Why is the stock market relatively protected? Um, so there's absolutely two pandemics. If you make over $100,000 a year, you've had no change in employment, no job interruption. There's literally no change in unemployment for people over making over $100,000 a year. And 60% and of them can do their job from home. If you make less than $40,000 a year, there's been a 40% of those people have incurred some sort of job interruption and less than 10% can work from home. So while a lot of us are at home watching our Uber stock go up, uh, uh, the other half of America has to pile their Diet Cokes and their diabetes medication into a igloo cooler and head out as an Uber driver and put themselves in harm's way. This is absolutely a tale of two worlds. Now, to your point around what's happened with the stock market, I, I believe that COVID-19 is, and I know this sounds conspiratorial, but it doesn't mean I'm wrong, has essentially been cloud cover to borrow money from future generations to fund a stimulus that has largely made rich people richer. Now, now let's look at the numbers. The $5 trillion that's gone to the stimulus, I would say $1 trillion has gotten to the people it's supposed to. Unemployment insurance, uh, um, earned income tax credits, uh, additional monies to food banks. We need to reach out to our brothers and sisters who are really hurting. But the rest of the stimulus, 15% of people who've received stimulus checks say they're, they're not going to spend it. That means more than four in five people who have received stimulus didn't really need it. We've spent another one and a half trillion dollars on corporate bailouts and PPP loans. We have, we have this weird idolatry of small business people. I'm a small business owner. We go out of business all the time. We have this weirdness around saving restaurants. You don't save restaurants. You let them go out of business. You let Delta Airlines go out of business. That's a part of the natural economic cycle. Capitalism is about letting forces of creative destruction low and gale and giving a younger generation opportunity to come in and buy that space and that business for a lot less. The reason I'm sitting here on the beach is because I bought and had an opportunity to buy Amazon and Apple stock at 10% of the price they're trading at now because the stock market was allowed to decline. So what do we have? Compensation nationally has only decreased by $50 billion. That's a bit of a misleading number. Because, because it includes raises that people have received. And it masks a lot of pain because a lot of the people who have lost their jobs weren't making a lot of money. So that number seems small. But nonetheless, the total net decrease in compensation across America through the pandemic was $50 billion. We then put a trillion dollars into people's hands in the form of stimulus. And then on top of that, Americans have saved in aggregate $500 billion because they're not going to Disneyland or to the Olive Garden. So you have one and a half trillion dollars in additional money in people's bank accounts that, quite frankly, didn't need it. So what have they done with that money? They've opened Robinhood accounts and they put it in the bank. Interest rates have plummeted to historic lows. They've opened stock trading accounts. And because they're new to the market, they, go, they don't do any sort of what I'll call robust analysis. They go into the story stocks. They go into Amazon, Apple, Facebook and Google. Apple which typically trades at 14 to 17 times earnings, is trading at 40 times earnings today. Tesla is up 700%. Elon Musk has added the GDP of Hungary to his personal net worth since the lows of the pandemic. So we have exploded the value of assets. Who owns 90% of assets in this country? The top 1%. So I would argue that our response to the novel coronavirus, 
let's call it what it is. We throw some loaves of bread. We throw a circus for the poor people. Maybe one in three, one in five dollars get to the people it's supposed to go to. And then we borrow money against the unborn. We borrow money against the young. By the way, I've seen their share of wealth in this country. If you're under the age of 40, your share of wealth in this country for the last 40 years has been halved. If you're in the bottom 50%, your share of wealth in this country is also halved. Such that we could make the rich super fucking rich. <laughs> this pandemic, this pandemic has been cloud cover to make the rich richer. America used to be about making the non-rich, giving the non-rich a shot at being rich. And all of a sudden we've decided our national priority in terms of our spending is to make the rich super rich. This has been nothing. We have played this virus like a Stradivarius, or at least the, the wealthy, the shareholder class. This has been outrageous. We have maxed out the credit card of the unborn to make people worth 10 million worth 30 million. Wow. I mean, you know, how would you like to have seen the stimulus deployed? I mean, obviously, you know, you're saying that it went to the wrong people, the small businesses. If it was your decision, how would you have used that, that, that stimulus package? Take the bottom 30% of income earning households. That's about 35 million households. A trillion dollars is $30,000 per household. Give them the money. The wonderful thing about lower income households is when you give money, they spend it all and they spend it all on services. They're the ones that should decide which restaurants get to survive this pandemic. They're the ones that get to decide which businesses survive. All this bullshit of bailing out small businesses, we, we built a ton of piers, not bridges. A lot of these companies aren't going to survive anyways. We've just kicked the can down the road or we've just increased the bank account of small business people. The wealthiest cohort in America, small business owners, the millionaire next door owns five dry cleaners. He didn't need a goddamn bailout, but he took it. And these were bailouts. They weren't loans. They're 100 percent forgivable. I'm on a Zoom call every week with my fraternity brothers from UCLA. We're all small business people. None of us needed a goddamn bailout. I was eligible for a quarter of a million bail a dollar loan bailout, free gift from government because I have a startup. My investors are are worth so much goddamn money and the notion that I was going to get a quarter of a million dollars from the government. By the way, we didn't take it, but a lot did. We should have put money in the hands of the poorest households, let them decide what businesses survive, get them out of harm's way, get them get you know, seven of the 10 happiest countries in the world, and when they register, when they look at how happy they are, are socialist countries. I'm not a socialist. I'm a full-throated capitalist. I think it's a better system. But the reason they're happy is not because of what they have, but because of the absence of fear of what can be taken away from them. They're not worried that when their wife is diagnosed with lung cancer, it also means they're going to go bankrupt. They don't have to endure the shame that their kids don't have enough to eat. We have so much shame so much despair in this country, and it's simple. Take that money, identify the lowest income people in America, give it to them. And the wonderful thing about them, when you need stimulus, is you need a multiplier effect. There's no multiplier effect when the owner of a cosmetic dentist office who gets a $400,000 PPP loan, he just puts it in the stock market. That does nothing for the economy but increase the wealth of the already rich who already own Amazon stock. You need to put it in the hands of poor people because they spend it all. And that creates a multiplier effect that repairs the economy. The problem with our economy, the threat to the economy, isn't a supply side. It isn't that businesses will go out of business. It's that there's not enough demand. And when you give a quarter of a million bucks to somebody who doesn't need it, they don't create any additional demand. They create additional investments, which lowers interest rates, takes asset prices up. Who owns assets? The rich people wash, rinse, and repeat. So I absolutely would have taken that stimulus, less of it, we didn't need $5 trillion in stimulus. Jesus Christ. I mean, come on. We needed a trillion, and you give it to people who are in harm's way, such that they're not food insecure, they don't make bad decisions around not distancing, and you say to our brothers and sisters that capitalism is about empathy. Capitalism literally implodes on itself if you don't redistribute income. And I'm not afraid to use the R word. You take the least fortunate you take the most income insecure people and you give them cash, full stop. You didn't need to say fucking Delta Airlines. Anyways, I'm really on my soapbox now. That's great, though. I love it. <laughs> you know, I mean, along those lines, when you're talking about the rich becoming super rich and the fact that we need to spread the wealth, you've been commonly quoted as talking about the big four, Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and how that monopoly, those four, 
is really bad for our overall economy. Explain why having those four mega companies continue to build off each other and off themselves. Why is that bad for this country? Key to capitalism and robust markets. I'll, I'll use a Florida analogy. You know, when we introduce uh, anacondas or whatever they are, when people start releasing them in the Everglades, they have no apex predator. And they've now diminished the population of alligators and deers and even the flora and fauna are starting to, because it's, a, it's an unnatural apex predator. These companies typically, typically are regulated by the FTC and the DOJ. And at this point in the past, we go in and we break them up and we oxygenate them because they're get so powerful, they can perform infanticide on small businesses and then put bigger mm -hmm. legacy companies who tend to be better employers and better taxpayers out of business prematurely. So try to start a computer hardware company. Let, you know, you and I should try and start a search engine. Let's see how that goes. Try and start an <laughs> e-commerce company right now. Try and start, there hasn't been a so social network started in America of any size since 2011. So the fastest growing parts of our economy are dominated by the monopolies or duopolies, meaning there's no startups and typically the companies that produce two thirds of the new jobs in America are small and medium sized businesses. So 30 years ago, 15% of companies were less than a year old. Now it's 7%. We, we believe if you read CNBC and the sycophants at the wall street journal, that we live in an era of innovation. No, we don't. We live in an era of non-innovation. There were twice as many companies being started every day during the Carter administration than there are now. Why? Because the fastest growing parts of our economy are dominated by one or two companies. We have a proud history of antitrust. We go in, and we break these people up. We are well beyond the point of these companies having so much power you can't compete against them. They do one of two things. They either put you out of business or they buy you. And that is not healthy for our economy. So a, a deconcentration of power, not only across big tech, but big pharma, big ag, big food, would be the most oxygenating thing for the economy. Capitalism has always had antitrust at the center of it. We broke up big oil. We broke up AT&T. We break up companies. We used to break up companies all the time. We've lost the script. We're so in love with these companies. They have absolutely overwhelmed, overrun Washington. There are more full-time lobbyists in D.C. working for Amazon than there are sitting U.S. senators. The PR bullshit spin masters at Facebook now outnumber, outnumber the number of journalists at the New York Times. Bezos has more people spinning the image and de decreasing the likelihood of legislation at his firm than he has journalists who work for him at the Washington Post, which is probably unhealthy, too. So we, we, have, we have lost our proud legacy of antitrust. The most oxygenating thing we could do for the economy would be to overfund the DOJ and the FTC and go industry by industry and deconcentrate it. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's important to note, you, you said it first, that actually breaking up those companies is not socialist, it's actually still capitalist. People may hear that and think that it's anti-capitalist, but it's actually pro-capitalist. And I think that's an important point that you make there. It's a key component of capitalism. Every capitalist society that succeeded has said, okay, congratulations, you get to a point of power where other saplings can't get any light. We're gonna cut the chops off trees. And by the way, if you're the largest shareholder in Amazon, when we break you up, you're going to get wealthier. Mark Zuckerberg is going to get up wealthier when we force him to spend WhatsApp and Instagram. And you unlock tremendous innovation. I, I think WhatsApp has not innovated since Facebook has purchased them. When AT&T was broken up, we found that all these technologies, including fiber, cell, data analytics, were lying fallow in Bell Labs because there was no motivation to compete with themselves when they had monopoly power. So it's a very capitalist thing. What isn't capitalist? is to let these companies overrun Washington, to let them weaponize the press, let, to let them beg for bailouts when things go bad. That's not capitalism, that's cronyism. So when you're a rugged individualist on the way up, and then you start calling for bailouts and tax breaks on the way down, that's not capitalism, it's not even socialism, it's cronyism. So, so gosh, breaking up companies is one of the most capitalist things we can do. That's how we oxygenate the economy. Let's talk briefly about uh, a part of society that, that's been really affected by the pandemic, and that's education for kids. Again, you've been quoted as saying that we're losing an entire generation of kids because of the changes in education. Can you, can you explain that a little bit? Um, you know, one of the scariest charts, so I put together these presentations and I'll have you know, 180 charts, I'll do a 60 minute presentation. Um, which I, I do, I, which I deliver to people and I either charge a shit ton of money for it 
Or someone calls me and says, I'm a neurosurgeon from Florida. And I say, I say, yes. But anyways, <laughs> is that what you do? You're a neuroscientist, neurosurgeon. What do you do? A uh, neurosurgeon. Jesus Christ, your mom must be so proud. Good for you. <laughs> anyway, so, so uh, the scariest chart in my entire deck is a chart showing that basically uh, low-income kids in public schools track with their middle and upper income cohorts uh, in school around math and STEM. Since the pandemic began and there's been remote learning, they have fallen off the map. And it's because, it's because quite frankly, uh, we've dispersed teaching and responsibility for teaching from schools, uh, primary schools, to the mom. And let's be honest, it's the mom. And in a low-income household, usually the mom has to go to work. In a low-income household, maybe that iPad got stolen. Maybe they don't have broadband. So you got an eight-year-old at home alone that's supposed to log in and figure out how to pay attention and do remote math. So they have literally 43% of them have dramatically declined and aren't keeping track with their middle and upper-income cohorts that have broadband, that have someone who can stay at home with them. So what does that mean? Just think of the morality of it. We're going to lose... Half our, we're going to lose a, a huge portion of our military leaders. We're going to lose great, great neurosurgeons. We're going to lose civic leaders. So this is just stupid to take an entire cohort and take them off track. And things are so competitive now. If you have kids, if your kid kind of comes off the tracks for one or two years, it is not easy for them to catch up. So the dispersion of the responsibility of learning from teachers to, to mothers in low-income neighborhoods that just don't have the capacity to provide the kind of oversight and technology required has resulted in what I believe is going to be one of the most damaging or lasting scars of this pandemic, and that is a lost generation of kids. And we'll see it. We'll see it in, in five or ten years. We're going to see fewer and fewer low-income kids who are qualified to get into great schools and go on and be neurosurgeons. Scott, if you were on Biden's staff, what would be your first couple moves? Um, I would, uh, I think they're doing it. I would, um, I would have, uh, federalized the supply chain. I would get the guys from Apple, Facebook, Google, Salesforce, uh, Walmart and say, and they're planning this, we need a hundred million vaccinations in the next hundred days. This is all hands on deck. This is war. Um, uh, the parking lots at Walmart should be not putting groceries in your, or they should be, when they put groceries in your trunk, they should also be sticking your arm. When my Nespresso pods show up tomorrow, 83% of U.S. households are members of Prime. You should be able to schedule your vaccination on your Alexa. The next day that individual's out, he or she has been trained, they stick your arm. If we can get 100 million vaccinations to the right people in the next 100 days, we could crush this curve. It is time for America to restore its rightful place as the most innovative nation in the world. It's time for us to demonstrate that we are a generous, empathetic people. So my first three priorities would be uh, vaccines, vaccines, and vaccines. I, I don't think anything, I don't think systemic racism, I don't think climate change, I think none of that happens until we, we, we bring the fight. I mean, the fucking fight to this virus. It is time to crush this thing. And we absolutely can do it. Uh, it just takes, I think, a collective, absolute, um, unified, full-throated capitalist response that we have, you know, that we are capable of, but we haven't demonstrated. The Trump admitted, nobody, uh, an Indian immigrant running Microsoft, a, a gay man raised in the South, a man who owns the Washington Post aren't going to put up with that fucking moron. They weren't going to get in front of him at a press conference and let him vampire their credibility and their supply chain and their stature such that he could wallpaper over his incompetence. So I am hopeful that, that we are, that it is a new day in America. And I hope, I hope that the entire world um, over the next hundred days is, 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 is gets to see what we are capable of in fighting an enemy. This is a, this is the biggest enemy we have ever faced. And there's absolutely no reason we shouldn't go. All of us should go at it. Yeah, I mean, amen. I just want to ask one last question. It's a quote of yours that I read that I thought was super fascinating. And you tell your students, don't follow your passion, 
but rather follow your talents, which I find absolutely amazing. Um, explain that quote and why you tell your students that. We invite two types of people to speak to the kids at NYU, either super interesting, impressive people or billionaires. We've decided if you aggregate three commas in your net worth that you have some sort of insight into life. And they always end their, their speeches with this bullshit advice, follow your passion. And usually the, if someone tells you to follow your passion, it means they're already rich. And usually the guy <laughs> on stage telling you to follow your passion made his billions in iron ore smelting. Your job is not to find your passion. Your job is to find something you're good at. And then once you identify something you're good at, invest the requisite discipline, grit, sacrifice, endurance through bullshit, breaking down hard barriers, and become great at it. And when you're great at something, the economic accoutrements, the camaraderie, the prestige, uh, the ability to find someone more interesting and better looking than you to, to marry, all of that shit will make you passionate about whatever it is. Tax accountants don't grow up or tax lawyers don't grow up passionate about tax law, but the best tax lawyers in the world fly private and have really wonderful lives, which makes them passionate about tax law. So yeah, Jay-Z followed his passion and became a billionaire. Assume you are not Jay-Z. It is dangerous to have that dictum in the back of your mind because work is hard. And when you face the injustice of the corporate world, which we all face, you're going to decide, well, maybe this isn't my passion. No, that's called work. The only question you got to ask yourself is, what am I good at? Anything you're good at, you're not going to hate. By virtue of you being good at it, you won't hate it. And then become great at it. And then, and then get economically secure and with your disposable income and your weekends, then go pursue your passions. Wow. Well, listen, we're going to wrap it up. I know you're super busy. You probably have a day at the beach there to relax. <laughs> um, but, you know, you know, really, um, thank you for your time. Obviously, very refreshing. All your views are amazing. Uh, the book is Post Corona, New York Times bestseller. Go out and buy it. It's a great read. Scott, again, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for your good work. Thank you for your empathy. Thank, thank you for... Uh, the love you show other Floridians. Thank you, University of Miami and the medical center there. Thank you for your good work and, and being on the front lines. All right, buddy. Have a great day, okay? Stay safe. Thanks, everybody.